History as it happens, July 21st, 2022. George Wallace Populism. Let us rise to the call of freedom-loving blood that is in us and send our answer to the tyranny that planks its chains upon the South in the name of the greatest people that have ever taught this earth. I draw the line in the dust and toss the gauntlet before the feet of tyranny and I say segregation now, segregation tomorrow, and segregation forever. George Wallace was a segregationist. He was a pro-union Democrat. He ran for president as an independent in 1968. George Wallace was a right-wing populist whose inheritors have found a home in the prevailing pro-Trump wing of the Republican Party. To understand our populist moment today, don't look to the 1930s Europe and the rise of fascism. Look at George Wallace, and that's next, as we report History As It Happens, a podcast from The Washington Times. I'm Martin DeCaro. As far as I'm personally concerned, the National Press Club can take their traditional certificate, and they know what they can do with it. American politics, as they became more and more polarized, they also became much more hard-edged. January 14, 1963, Alabama's new governor delivers his inaugural address. After swearing to uphold segregation, George Wallace explains true freedom can only come by keeping the races apart. We invite the Negro citizens of Alabama to work with us from his separate racial station, as we will work with him to develop, to grow in individual freedom and enrichment. We want jobs and a good future for both races. We want to have the physically and mentally sick of both races, the tuberculosis and the infirm. This is the basic heritage of my religion, of which I make full practice, for we are all the handiwork of God. And as for those espousing integration in so-called civil rights, Wallace calls them the spreaders of a false doctrine of communist amalgamation. And so launched the national political aspirations of one of the most polarizing politicians in American history. Later that year, June 1963, Wallace, combining racism and opportunism in front of the TV cameras, infamously stood in the schoolhouse door at the University of Alabama to stop black students from walking in. The unwelcomed, unwanted, unwarranted, and force-induced intrusion upon the campus of the University of Alabama, today of the might of the central government, offers frightful example of the oppression of the rights, privileges, and sovereignty of this state by officers of the federal government. Uh, the old states' rights argument. So George Wallace is best remembered for his opposition to creating a multiracial democracy. Segregation forever, he said. Well, he lost that fight, but his positions on other issues, articulated in so many speeches and television interviews, have found an echo in today's right-wing populism. And in that respect, George Wallace seems to be a bit overlooked. Think of all the essays and editorials you've read over the past couple of years comparing the crisis of American democracy to the rise of fascism in Europe, comparing Donald Trump to Hitler. Well, those comparisons are pretty weak. Trump sounds a lot more like George Wallace. And we're looking for more than mere coincidences or similarities here. We're looking for a thread from the past to help explain our present. Because when the Alabama governor ran for president, he railed against the breakdown of law and order as American cities burned. And he found a receptive audience. We don't have any utopia in Alabama, neither do you have it here in New York City, where you can't even walk in Central Park here at night without fear of being raped or mugged or shot. And it's a sad day in our country that you cannot walk even in your neighborhoods at night or even in the daytime because both national parties in the last number of years have kowtowed to every group of anarchists that have roamed the streets of San Francisco and Los Angeles and throughout the country. I am your president of law and order and an ally of all peaceful protesters. But in recent days, Our nation has been gripped by professional anarchists, violent mobs, arsonists, looters, criminals, rioters. He talked about standing up for downtrodden working-class Americans who are forgotten by the establishment and looked down upon by elites. This is a people's movement. It doesn't make any difference whether the major politicians are going to support you or not. If they don't support us in this movement, 
to take back our government and give it to us and let us run our own institutions, those who stand in the way are liable to get run over by you people who are in this auditorium here tonight. <clears throat> the establishment protected itself, but not the citizens of our country. Their victories have not been your victories. And while they celebrated in our nation's capital, there was little to celebrate for struggling families all across our land. And Wallace was a performer, too. He loved to mock his hecklers. I love you, too. I sure do. Oh, I thought you were a she. You a he. Oh, my goodness. He can't get a date, so he's doing this instead. Come on. How old is this kid? How old is this kid? Get out of here. Still wearing diapers. Performance aside, when it came to politics or ideology, in George Wallace's worldview, American society was a battle of the states, usually the southern states, versus the central government. Us versus them. Real Americans, white, hardworking, law-abiding, tax-paying Americans, versus the commies, liberals, bureaucrats, mobs, anarchists, judges, and civil rights activists, who wanted to rip up the Constitution. If the word woke were around in the 1960s, Wallace would have used it. So does this mean Wallace paved the road to Trump? Well, his impact in 1968 did influence Nixon's Southern strategy and the remaking of the South over the next three decades into a Republican stronghold. But what I'm getting at here is Wallace and Trump operating a half century apart, both sensed the time was right for their message whether we call it populism or something else. They tapped into widespread anger and alienation on the part of white working class Americans who had lost confidence in the major parties. But where Wallace failed, Trump made it all the way to the White House. Dan Carter is Professor Emeritus of History at the University of South Carolina and the author of the definitive biography, The Politics of Rage, George Wallace, The Origins of the New Conservatism and the Transformation of American Politics. Dan Carter, welcome. Good to be here, Martin. So in the current discourse, of which there is no shortage, about the crisis of American democracy and our populist moment on the left and the right, do you think George Wallace is overlooked, not by professional historians such as yourself, in general? Partly, although I've managed to make a, a racket out of it by talking about him a little bit in, in the media, but you're right, there is not a lot of recognition. He's occasionally mentioned in conjunction with Trump or other individuals. And that's partly because he was a Democrat, but the Democrats certainly don't want to claim him. He, his ideas may be closely linked to a later generation of Republicans, but they certainly don't want to claim him in part because the GOP is very concerned about the charge of racism. And the last thing they want to do is to have uh, have their name and their party linked to George Wallace. And segregation is, well, segregation as it existed, some people say it still exists, not institutionally, but in other ways. But no one says, yes, I'm a proud segregationist anymore. <laughs> you know. No, yeah. no. Well, you know, I, I think for all the talk of how we got here, it's surprising that we don't hear more about Wallace and this strain of right-wing populism, right? Because we get a lot of comparisons to 1930s Europe, but I find those to be pretty weak, don't you? Well, Martin, I think partly it reflects the, the very difficulty of the term populist. I had a long and drawn out uh, argument with my editor at Simon & Schuster when I published the biography. She wanted to use the term populist, and I, I find it so elastic and so difficult to pin down that I sometimes use it for convenience, but I'm always conscious of the, of the difficulties of it. When we say populist, what we're really saying is they're popular with the people. Well, Franklin Roosevelt was enormously popular in the 1930s, but I don't think anybody would call him a populist. What we generally mean when we say populist is that there is a kind of raw edge to it. Someone who is popular and a political figure who's willing to push the boundaries in terms of both decorum and in terms of uh, exciting the uh, support of his followers. 
I was going to ask you, how do you define populism? I did a whole episode with Michael Kazin about this. He gave me his definition. And maybe also a more direct connection to ordinary people, you know, standing up for ordinary people versus the, the powers that be, whoever they are, right? big tech, big corporations, you know, whoever it is. That's part of it. Yes. I mean, that is certainly every major individual, whether they're a politician or otherwise, who we link with populism, as there were a lot of them in the 1930s, they always saw themselves as voices of the people and uh, Wallace even more than others. Well, Wallace's time on the scene as a populist was abbreviated, but that's not unusual for third parties in American history. There may be no direct parallel between Wallace and Donald Trump in today's Republican Party, and we can get into that. But I think there are parallels in the sets of circumstances in both eras. So I want to talk about that before we get to Wallace himself. What forces were behind the alienation of working class whites in the 1960s? so that they found someone like Wallace attractive. You know, what made these Americans, especially in the South, susceptible to his message? There were a lot of reasons, but I'm sorry. I, <laughs> I've looked at all of them, and I can't think that there is any force, any motivation greater than race. Think about it. You're, go you're undergoing something like a kind of revolution in regional politics, in a region where something like 85% of whites believe that segregation, legal segregation, which had existed really de facto pretty much since uh, Reconstruction, was suddenly being dramatically and to their mind immediately overturned between the Supreme Court decision in the late 1950s and early 1960s. Understandably, and that's not to excuse it, but understandably, I think, they rebelled against that. There were other factors, and I don't deny those. There was always deep in the region a sense of inferiority among whites, a feeling that they were looked down. In part, that's just a traditional kind of rural urban thing. You know, I'm a hayseed, I'm a hick, and those city slickers are looking down on me. But it was particularly deep in the South. I mean, Wallace never began one of his talks, or seldom did, in the South without saying we're just as cultured and refined as anybody else, as though everybody was saying you're not so cultured, not so refined. Now, we find that many of our Negro citizens have gone to New Jersey, to Michigan and to New York because politicians in those states have said it's so good here and it's so bad in Alabama. But we find that many of them who went there came back and said it's a lot better in Alabama than it was there. Or as Trump said at one point, uh, I like the uneducated. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. right. We won with young. We won with old. We won with highly educated. We won with poorly educated. I love the poorly educated. Yes, that's right. And he, he would probably have been a little slicker about it. I mean, he would say that we're just as smart as anybody else. We're just as educated as anybody else. But it was that underlying sense of people looking down on us. It became even more so in the 60s because of the civil rights movement and the way in which it was couched in the national media, in which white Southerners were the villains and the uh, members of the civil rights movement were the heroes. And it was painful, I think. And there was also a sense... Well, in the 1960s, right, that our society was fraying, right? The bonds of the republic were breaking apart. Wallace talked about equality a lot, white equality. So did he believe that equality for blacks was a threat to white people? I hate to say this because it implies a level of extraordinary cynicism, but I don't think Wallace really began with any terribly strong views about race. I interviewed people who knew him in the 1940s and early 1950s. It just wasn't a preoccupation of his. Of course, it because it wasn't being challenged at that time. Yeah. But he didn't walk out of the 48 convention with the rest of the Dixiecrats. Yes. He began his career as a Franklin Roosevelt Democrat. And his guiding light in Alabama politics was being Jim Folsom, who's probably the most liberal, both racially and economically, politician in the South in modern history. Yeah. So he, yes, he was not caught up initially in the race issue, but he was a very um, 
very focused on power. And when he realized that using race was a way to gain power, he had no hesitation about doing it. As you said, it wasn't being challenged at the time. And then, well, 1948 was the first time the Democratic yes. Party had that in its platform, uh, civil rights. But when the time came, when the racial status quo was being upended, that's when he adopted his ferociously racist views. He was unabashed about it, right? He made no attempt to hide his racism. Actually, he did. <laughs> wow, how about that? I say hide it. In reality, it was there in plain sight. But even early on, even in the early 1960s, privately, and I've talked to, as I said, dozens of individuals around him, race talk was normal. The use of the N-word was normal. But with rare exceptions, Wallace did not use overtly racist language, even as early as the 1960s. Uh, He couched it in terms of uh, he had a series of euphemisms, which became more common as time went on. He would, for example, in politics, he wouldn't talk about black voters. He would talk about the black vote, which meant the black Democratic vote. Yeah. But he always left it in uh, in his listeners' mind, the ability to make those connections. They voted as a block, B-L-O-C. Right, yes. exactly. And uh, if you go back and look at his uh, statements at the time, he tried for the most part to argue that segregation was a matter of states' rights. It was like best for both races and so on. And he often, as he did, couch it in terms of constitutional rights rather than race. And although everybody knew exactly what he was talking about. So this matter of the so-called civil rights bill is an attack upon the property system in our country. You know, we hear all of these pickets and left-wingers and sign, and people have a right to picket. Let me tell you this. I have no objection to peaceful picketing. That's a part of the American heritage and the American system. But you know, when they talk about human rights above property rights, you know that sounds good, but let's just analyze it a moment. There's one exception, Martin, and it's one that's been dramatically overlooked, I think. George Wallace gave his inaugural speech, which kind of marked his coming out nationally in 1963, January 1963. Governor of Alabama, right? Sworn in as governor of Alabama. And he gave a speech, which was about 25 minutes long and uh, got tremendous national coverage. As I said, it launched his national career. But the coverage focused almost entirely on the issue of segregation. It had the famous line. And I say segregation now, segregation tomorrow, and segregation forever. And virtually no reporters, national reporters or even local reporters, went into any great depth on that speech. And that speech was written by a white nationalist, racist speech writer, who later became um, very famous under a different name. And it it's extraordinarily racist. Yeah. I mean, if you read the rest of the speech, it basically says that uh, blacks are incapable of self-government. They shouldn't play a role in government. Each race within its own framework has the freedom to teach, to instruct, to develop, to ask for and receive deserved help from others, a separate racial station. This is a great freedom of our American founding fathers. But if we amalgamate into the one unit as advocated by the communist philosophers, then the enrichment of our lives, the freedom of our development is gone forever. We become therefore a mongrel unit of one under a single all-powerful government and we stand for everything and for nothing. He read the speech that uh, Asa Carter had written for him, but you don't see it like that afterwards. Really an exception, I think. Because as I said before, he talked a lot about white equality or maintaining the status quo for the sake of society or opposing federal tyranny, standing up for states' rights. But as you just explained, he also could veer into this territory where he was a demagogue. Another question about context before we get to some of the other aspects of this conversation. From reading Michael Kazin's book on populism and his chapter about George Wallace, you get the sense that there were working class white people who believe that they were somehow now being left behind or ignored by the elites. 
and radical leftist academics after the two prosperous decades following World War II. These Americans thought they worked hard, played by the rules, obeyed the law, paid their taxes, and now they began to resent how the government was helping other people, black people, the welfare state. They did not appreciate the high-minded snobbery of intellectual elites, and many weren't happy with the Vietnam War as well. So there seemed to be a lot going on in addition to the civil rights revolution. There were some economic strains that were developing, even in the prosperous 60s, in which uh, if you look at it closely economically, certainly from 65 to 75, the position of working class Americans was at best in stasis or staying the same, and in some cases was, uh, was declining. And there was a certain pressure about that, I think. But it was very much keyed to the role of the federal government, which became an ideal villain. And as Wallace came to develop that wonderful vocabulary, it was all a bunch of lying, hypocritical, carpet-bagging judges and bureaucrats who couldn't park their bicycles straight. Mm -hmm. It became a kind of dramatic tableau, if you want to call it that. Don't worry about what the newspapers say about us. They call us extremists and want to say we are fascists. Well, I want to tell these newspapers something. These large newspapers who think they know more than the average citizen on the street in New York, you have always been right. So George Wallace in 1967, a year before he ran as an independent, not as a Democrat, for president, he said this, I think that if the politicians get in the way, a lot of them are going to get run over by this average man on the street, this man in the textile mill, this man in the steel mill, this barber, the beautician, the policeman on the beat, they're the ones, and the little businessman. I think those are the mass of people that are going to support a change on the domestic scene in this country. I mean, that's something that Bernie Sanders Sanders would say today, if we just, you know, pulling <laughs> the quote right. entirely out of context, right? We could put that in Bernie Sanders' mouth, right? When it came to his economic program, were there any specifics there, or was it just railing against powerful forces? Well, the railing was against the federal government. George Wallace was a tax and spend liberal in terms of state politics. <laughs> Part of it was the fact that, and it's almost forgotten in economic history, that the 1950s and 1960s, as one governor, when I interviewed Governor Brewer of Alabama, he said, oh, those are the glory days. The tax money was coming in. We could spend it any way we wanted. And in Wallace's case, his great failure was he initially started out trying to increase taxes on the wealthy. And he started out that way, even as a segregationist governor. He didn't, but he did increase state expenditures for middle class and working class people in Alabama, whether it was the schools, whether it was uh, rural farm to market highways. These were things that made him an enormous, uh, quite apart from his racial rhetoric, made him enormously popular in Alabama. He was a pro-union Democrat. Although he didn't emphasize it on when he became a national candidate, the fact is he never was willing to turn his back on his support for unionized labor. He opposed right to work laws mm -hmm. as governor, and he continued to do so. There are things about Wallace that no, I mean, nobody knows. He was, for example, a ardent supporter of Roe v. Wade. Mm -hmm. uh, he refused initially until it became such a powerful uh, issue later on, he strongly supported Roe v. Wade when it came out and made several statements in, in support of it. An opportunist, maybe. Yes, in somewhat. some ways. Some have observed that his speeches, especially as he ran for president over and over again and continued to really not make too much of a dent, although he did make a dent, that he was light on substance, what you might call sound bites today, that you know, he wasn't a, a deep thinker about these things. You know, I think Wallace was incredibly smart, but he was above all a performer. Yeah. Performance at this time was more and more evolving and I think had an impact from popular culture. I love you too, I sure do. Oh, I thought you were a she, you a he, oh my goodness. 
the word soundbite is a very good one. It's not like the Lincoln-Douglas debates yeah. where people come and wait for hours listening to Senator Douglas and aspiring Senator Abraham Lincoln lecture for three or four hours on complex aspects of slave law. They were there for entertainment. Yeah. That's a good way of putting it, a performer, when I said yes. that he wasn't a, a deep thinker. He was smart. He wasn't an idiot. And you know, I'm not paying this man a compliment. I'm just looking at this in a historical in a historical context. So folks might be listening to this and say, okay, Martin, you're, you have this historian who's written about Wallace on because you're trying to figure out if Wallace populism shapes or influences American politics today. Well, you know, Republicans today aren't segregationists. And, you know, his economic platform was more on the Democratic side of things. Republicans today are for right to work laws in states. They're not a pro-union party. So what am I getting at? Well, here's the parallel. The politics of backlash, the politics of resentment, the politics of anger. Do you agree with that? Yes, and he did have an impact and a, and a very concrete impact, particularly in the 1968 campaign, more in the 68 campaign than he did in 72, in the sense that he forced Richard Nixon to run a different kind of campaign, to adopt different kind of policies. At one point, Nixon did more than timidly come out attacking Wallace fairly gently for his uh, anti-busing rhetoric that he thought it was too extreme. And uh, Wallace's uh, response was, this campaign gets a little further along. Mr. Nixon will be down here taking the batteries out of the buses. And sure enough, when Nixon watched the growing popularity, which at one time in 1968 reached 27 percent of the American electorate, and almost 40 percent of white Americans said that would be their choice for president. Nixon tacked to the right immediately and changed his policies, became much more anti-busing and, uh, in a sense, anti-welfare as well. Yeah, I think that's where we could start looking at how Wallace has influenced the Republican Party since his time, the Southern strategy, right? And uh, anyone who wants to see just how critical that was can go back to... uh, Kevin Phillips' book in 1969, Kevin Phillips was a very young, he changed his politics later on, very young analyst of American politics. And he argued that the future of the Republican Party lay in creating a solid Republican South to replace the old solid Democratic South. And the strategy, he argued, was that every piece of their political strategy should be designed to do one thing. And that is to place whites in the Republican Party and blacks in the the emerging blacks because they were voting in the Democratic Party. 1968 election. George Wallace won 46 electoral votes. This is the man who said segregation forever. He won five states all in the South. He won Louisiana, Alabama, Mississippi, South Carolina and Tennessee. I'm looking at a map, a Mm color-coded map, so my geography skills are holding up pretty well here. But that's kind of unsettling, right, that someone with his views would win 9 million votes. So Nixon was 31 million, Humphrey was 31 million, but Nixon won 301 electoral votes. Wallace won 46. Well, part of it is it's even more, I think, unsettling in some ways was not just the Southern vote, but the sizable percentage of the vote that he got, not across the country outside the region, but in many Midwestern states. Ohio, for example, there was a substantial uh, Wallace vote, about 10 percent. Several other northern states as well. And this is what terrified, uh, terrified is the wrong word. This is what frightened Nixon, because if you go back and look at the Electoral College, which is what matters, Shifting just a few thousand votes in three or four states would have thrown the election in the House of Representatives. So it's 46 votes would have made him the kingmaker. So I think from 68 on to 72, I wouldn't say that that Nixon was dancing to Wallace's tune, but he had to keep Wallace in mind the whole time. And in that sense, it is a long term impact as well. 
And don't, don't forget, we're talking about 68. But in 1972, when George Wallace was almost assassinated, was shot in Laurel, Maryland, he was actually the leading Democratic candidate at the time. Yeah, I was going to ask votes. you, why did he not run as an independent again? He ran as a Democrat after that. Oh, I mean, I guess the obvious thing is you can't win as an independent. It's it's he realized. Um, but he couldn't he win realized, as a Democrat either. But go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I think actually his feeling was that there was no future in an independent party, that we were basically a two party country. And if he was going to reach the presidency, which he really did by that time, think he had a had a chance to do it. He had to do it as a Democrat. That's why he abandoned his uh, independent party. And then, as you mentioned, 72, he is shot while campaigning. He's in a wheelchair the rest of his life. He runs again in 76, but by then he was a spent force. And I guess you might say the populist moment had passed. Why, in the final analysis, wasn't Wallace able to be more appealing outside the South? Well, he was too Southern. <laughs> I mean, uh, is it, I'm from New York. I was born in New York City. Is it possible to be too Northern? <laughs> uh, I don't think so. No, I think yeah, uh, the I mean. South has a special kind of place. I'm, I'm really sensitive about this. Having grown up in the South, I once back in the early 80s, I narrated the program for PBS. And when they did a survey, they asked these five focus groups around the country, did they place great confidence in the narrator? despite his southern accent. One group in Massachusetts said no, and a group in California said no, and the group in Kentucky said what southern accent? So I think there was, I I mean, I don't want to overplay that. Yeah, I know what you mean. I think the legacy of whether rightly, and I think rightly, his close association with racial issues and his close association with the politics of racial resistance just in an increasingly politically correct America, at least minimally politically correct, made it difficult for him to run as a national candidate. In 1964 is the Civil Rights Act. 1965 is the Voting Rights Act. So the country was moving on. I mean, he would have been better off running in the 1880s or the 1870s or the 1850s. But people today who believe that Donald Trump's success was because of race not class or economics. There are some people who believe, period, it was race. Donald Trump appealed to racial resentments, or I should say white status anxieties. So it's not segregation anymore, but there are other issues involving race. They might say, well, if Wallace ran today as a Republican, he could win. Now, I don't, I don't know if that's true, but what's your take on Trump and this issue of whether, is Trump a populist? Did he win because of racial anxieties and nothing else? No, I don't believe he won because of racial anxieties and nothing else. He won for a whole variety of reasons. In part, um, American politics, as they became more and more polarized, they also became much more hard edged. Wallace played a role in that. But in, in many ways, if you, you know, if you look at Republican candidates, even Nixon tried to avoid ever appearing to be racist. Ronald Reagan may have sent out these signals, but he didn't emphasize, certainly George H.W. Bush, despite his use of the race issue in the 1988 campaign, that was not the main thrust of their thinking. It was still politically correct, and certainly for a presidential candidate to avoid that. That changes in, in the late 1980s and early 90s. Thanks to people like Pat Buchanan, for example, even more so Newt Gingrich, who's famous for changing the whole rhetoric of politics. And it paves the way for someone who, A, is not a Southerner, has a a kind of gift that may not be reflect any deep thinking. Donald Trump really is. He was a mile wide and an inch deep, as someone said, but he had a mastery of performance. And you know what else they say about my people? The polls. They say, I have the most loyal people. Did you ever see that? Where I could stand in the middle of Fifth Avenue and shoot somebody and I wouldn't lose any voters, okay? It's like incredible. And that was what Wallace said. So they brought the $18 bill south and they saw no grizzled northeast Alabama mountaineer sitting by a little store. 
And one of these Washington counterfeiters said, here's a place to pass the first one. You can always tell a book by its cover. So they agreed, and they went into the little store, and one of them said, Captain, can you give us change for an $18 bill? And the old southern, northeast Alabama mountaineer said to the Washington, I show sure can. Do you want three sixes or two nines? <laughs> All of those same grievances had expanded, not just race as it was heavily in the 1960s and 70s, but a whole series of other other cultural grievances, the sexual revolution that took place in the uh, 70s and 80s, a series of Supreme Court decisions that a lot of people resented that uh, weren't just racial as well. Abortion was becoming a big issue, yeah. those kinds of things. So yeah, it was much broader than that. I did represent more of the average citizen in this country than did any other candidate, based on the fact that the man who works each day for a living and pays the taxes and holds the country together has been ignored, except on election day. I agree that Trump did not win on racial anxieties alone. Uh, there's nothing is just determined by one issue. It's multi-determined, as they say, or over-determined. Yes. Um, but Trump was an entertainer, is an entertainer, as was Wallace, as we discussed. Mm-hmm. He also had a great sense of timing and... Again, for the parallel we might be seeking here, if it works, it's the resentment, it's the anger, or just the sense that the establishment, however defined, has failed you. Trump went to the Carrier Air Conditioning Plant in Indiana in 2015 or 2016, and he spoke to those economic anxieties about NAFTA and you know the loss of good-paying manufacturing jobs to Mexico. So I guess maybe we'll We'll wrap up. Maybe I'll finally get around to asking a question instead of just talking here. What is Wallace's lasting impact? Because it's not economic philosophy or I don't know if it has much lasting impact on the platforms of either party. Right. So what is it? It is heavily performance style. It's a break from the kind of politics. We certainly had individuals who royal the waters, Joe McCarthy, somebody like that. But by and large, American politics in the 20th century, once you get past the Great Depression of the 1890s, is a pretty congenial operation. And Wallace was the first one, I think, in uh, modern politics who really begins to break those traditions and to emphasize the kind of hard edge differences that it's either you're with me or you're against me. There's no in-between. On some college campuses, we got folks raising money and blood and clothes and sending it to the communists. And I can tell you when some of you young people are committed totally between life and death, you're not going to think too kindly against some fella back with a beard raising some money to give the communists to help take your life. And that was certainly true for Wallace, and that was certainly true for Donald Trump. We are now in the process of defeating the radical left, the Marxists, the anarchists, the agitators, the looters. Wallace wanted hecklers at his campaign events, right? Because he, he, he wanted the conflict and then he would insult them. I was at the University of Maryland in 1968 and he was campaigning and I was going over to the field house Several of the Wallace people were frantic because the uh, local local organizers had very carefully called all the hippies out. They wouldn't let them into the auditorium. And the Wallace people were saying, no, no, we need them. We need them. Let them in. Let them in. They were going literally going around, rounding up anybody that had bell bottom trousers and uh, <laughs> and wild shirts and their little signs uh, and slogans and pushing them in there because they wanted them in there because Wallace was a master at using them as foils in his speeches. I said that would be my last question or point, but one more, and you've been very generous with your time. When it comes to the economic populism in today's Republican Party, smart Republicans anyway, realize the anger and the resentment and the anti-establishment stuff is not enough. And it does seem that the Republican Party is doing better among working class whites. I'm not sure what their message is or economic platform is for these people, but they do seem to get the sense that culture war issues are not enough. And you're seeing it in polls, right, where More working class whites are migrating to the Republican Party. Latinos are migrating to the Republican Party. Any observations about that? Well, I don't want to certainly don't want to predict the future. I did a New York Times op-ed piece in January of 
2016, in which I predicted brilliantly against uh, <laughs> all the odds that Donald Trump was going to be nominated by the Republican Party at a time when he wasn't taken seriously. Unfortunately, I added a uh, sentence that he was not going to be elected president of the United States because I thought that was a bridge too far. I really don't believe the party has, the Republican Party has a, an economic philosophy. It doesn't need one right now because the politics of resentment and cultural issues are powerful. And that's why the party doesn't have a platform. Because once you start laying out specifics, then you begin to expose internal contradictions in the party. That's right. They have no uh, platform. I mean, it's, it's the Republican Party was the party of free trade. Well, Donald mm-hmm. Trump marked the end of that. And you could go through a whole series of measures that economically are not particularly helpful. The fact that the middle class is shrinking and uh, income in- inequality in America is growing rapidly. None of the policies of the party deal with any of that. So I think that Mitch McConnell, uh, who's really the genius in the party these days, is exactly right from a power point of view. You don't lay out a specific policy because it's dangerous. It exposes the fissures in the party. People like Ted Cruz and Josh Hawley, they're not populists, despite what they may say. I'm I'm trying to identify in my own mind who are the populists in the Republican Party who are apparently successfully getting more working class whites in their column. I believe the governor of Florida is probably right now is the most likely person to uh, pick up the reins of Donald Trump. What was it to David Gerson said that uh, Donald Trump was the evil mastermind without the mastermind? I think in the case of the governor of Florida, he's, as the Democrats would say, the evil mastermind. (laughs) Well, Democrats better get their acts together. then. (laughs) Historian Dan Carter, we thank you for your time and insights about George Wallace populism. On the next episode of History As It Happens, we're going to talk about the rise of declinism. Historian Michael Kimmage will be here to talk about whether the right and left are wrong about America's future. Maybe we're not in decline after all. That's next as we report History As It Happens, a podcast from The Washington Times.